cares? I mean, I just want to, you know what? I'm going to invite you this, this morning to just participate with me today here. So by a show of hands, can you believe the price of gas these days? Like $4 a gallon? I mean, who cares about that? Yeah, there you go. That's right. So everyone whose hand didn't go up, I'm taking you got electric cars, right? Amen. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And how about the NBA Finals? NBA Finals. I mean, we have the Phoenix Suns versus the Milwaukee Bucks. Now, who cares about that? that that's right. So probably our Arizona, res, maybe, or, or somebody from Wisconsin, or maybe some of those um, Laker fans who've jumped ship already. Yeah, there we go. Oh, and how about this? How about the fact that Thomas, Connor, David, and Christian a couple of weeks ago got eliminated on The Bachelorette? Now, who cares about that? <laughs> Not I, but I know some of you do, some of you do, so, but we laugh, we laugh, and it's humorous because we think about this idea of who cares, but we know, as Pastor Ben shared, that we're in this sermon series, or last week, and it's who cares about the world, who cares for the world, and we know, of course, that we've been through, with who cares for the church, we care, who cares for our neighbors, we care, yeah, there we go, yeah, we care. As followers of Jesus Christ, we all care and we should care for these areas. And so today we're going to focus on this idea of caring for the world, caring for the world. And we're going to reflect that when we care for the world, we're reflecting the heart of Jesus. When we care for the world, I want you to think about that. When we care for the world, we reflect the heart of Jesus. When we think about this idea of the world, I want to give you a snapshot of our world today kind of by the numbers. In 2020, Mercy Corps did a report that around 9 million people die every year of hunger and hunger-related disease. And that number is more than AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. 9 million people. And worldhunger.org estimates that a child dies from hunger every 10 seconds globally. Every 10 seconds, a child dies around the world. So that means by the time we finish our worship service today, over 360 children will have died from hunger around the world. It's also a world that the UN estimates that 40.3 million people are being trafficked globally, human trafficking. 40.3 million victims. And that number is equivalent to the entire state of California's population. 40.3 million people trafficked globally. And the Office of Economic Development estimates nearly 73 million children between the ages of 5 and 17 are being enslaved, separated from their families, exposed to serious hazards, and left to fend for themselves on the streets. And that number rose dramatically this past year, especially as the coronavirus hit around the world. And so as citizens of the world, we should all care deeply about these numbers because every number represents a human being created in the image of God. And as followers of Jesus, though, we should also care about the fact that there are about approximately 2 billion people around the world that have never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. 2 billion billion people. And there's over 70,000 people who will die every day globally having never placed their faith in Jesus Christ. That number 70,000 represents a greater number than the Monterey Peninsula population combined. Entire population of the Monterey Peninsula. 70,000 people will die every day never placing their faith in Jesus Christ. And so as we've learned from Pastor Dennis and Pastor Keith the last couple of weeks that there is a, a, a big, a massive difference between caring about something and caring for something or someone. And so we think about this idea of caring about means that we're moved emotionally, we're moved intellectually, and maybe we're even deeply moved physically. But caring for implies we do something about it. 
It's taking action upon that which just moved us. I want to give you a little picture here. I was thinking about this, the difference between caring about and caring for. So my wife and I, we have a, our house, and we have a little garden. And, and I, I love that little garden. And so imagine if my wife and I decide to go on a vacation for a couple of weeks. And we have three grandchildren that live here locally. And so if we ask our grandkids, we say, hey, so uh, kids, come on over here. While we're gone, will you please take care of Grandpa's garden? And so if you look over here, you see the tomatoes. And so those tomatoes, oh, they need watering, okay? So make sure you give them some water. And over here, see, there's Grandpa's peppers. Oh, he loves his peppers. But you know, if you're not careful, the weeds will grow up around him. And what will happen is the peppers will get enveloped by the weeds. And over there, you see those beautiful cherry trees? Oh, those got some beautiful cherries on them. But you got to be careful because the birds will come. And you got to make sure that you scare the birds off if they come and try to take those cherries away. So imagine our surprise two weeks later when we come back from vacation. And I look out there, and there's my tomato plants. And they're like this. <laughs> completely dead, dried out. Oh, there. Oh, and there's my peppers. They've been overrun with weeds. No peppers even there anymore. And I look at my beautiful cherry trees, and they've been completely ravaged by the blue jays and nothing left but stems. And I say to my grandkids, I say, kids, what happened? We asked you to take care of the garden. And they said, well, Grandpa, we looked out the window and we, we came over and we saw that the tomatoes, they looked like they needed water and we were deeply moved. And then we saw your peppers and we saw the weeds coming up and we said, Grandpa, 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 when we saw that and we were just, our hearts were broken. And then when we saw those blue jays coming in taking all your, cher your cherries, Grandpa, oh, that made us so mad. We started to cry. We were so angry. Now, if your grandkids are like my grandkids, are perfect grandkids, that would never happen, okay? But it just points out there is a massive difference in there between caring about something and caring for. And I love that also that Keith and Dennis highlighted this idea that caring is also synonymous with the words love and serve, right? Caring is also loving and serving. So when we care for someone, we're demonstrating love in a tangible manner. We're serving them in a tangible way. And so the question then for us today is, why should we care about the world? Why should we care for the world? Isn't that like the UN's job? I mean, isn't that something that somebody else should do? I mean, we have enough issues here at home, don't we? And that, the answer is yes, we do have a lot of issues here on the home front. But we also know that God cares about and God cares for the world. And how do we know that? Because his word is clear. One of the most famous Bible verses out there, John 3, 16, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. See, that word world, the, the Greek there is cosmos. And in this case, it's used, it means mankind, humanity, every tribe, every nation, every people, every color, every creed. God so loved the world. And what did God do about that? God gave. God cared about and God cared for. He gave. And what did he give? He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus himself, he cared about the world, and he cared for the world. He gave his life for the world. Every nation, every tribe, every color, every creed, every person, he offered his life so that they could have eternal life by believing in him. See, God so loved you that he gave his son. And God so loved you that he gave his son. And God loved you. And God loved you. And what did God do? He cared for you by offering his son and the free gift of eternal life by believing in him. And so we think about this idea that God cares about and God cares for the world. We are called then to model God's love. We look at Jesus' sacrifice and we say, we're a follower of Jesus, we want to love Jesus. So in that reality that he gave for us and that we are his followers, we are now going to go out and care for the world. And so how do we know how Jesus cared for the world? How can we know? What? Tell me how Jesus, we can go to his word. We can go specifically to the gospels. And we see story after story after story of how God Jesus Christ cared for the world. 
So one story I want to share today, just one snapshot in the life of Jesus comes from Matthew's gospel, chapter 15, verses 29 through 38. So I want to invite you to turn with me there. If you have your Bibles or if you have your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up. And we're going to rest in here. We're going to walk through what I call kind of four lessons that we can take away from Jesus as he cares for the world in very practical, very personal, very powerful way. So beginning in verse 29, we read, Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. And then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. And Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? Well, how many loaves do you have, Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground, and then he took the seven loaves and the fish, and when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000 men besides women and children. And so as we read this story, very familiar for many of you, just this powerful reminder of how Jesus cared for the world. And so I want to look at lesson number one from this. How can we see Jesus modeling this and how can we learn from this? Lesson number one is caring for the world offers hope and healing in the name of Jesus. Hope and healing in the name of Jesus. Now, Jesus, all throughout his ministry, all through the Gospels, we see he ministers, he goes all throughout the land of Israel. But most often we'll see Jesus teaching and feeding and healing up in and around the Sea of Galilee, which is located in the northern portion of Israel. And the reason is, I believe the reason is, is because as Jesus is up in that location, people would come from all directions. They would come from the north. They would come from nations that, that didn't worship the God of Israel. They would come from the west. They would come from the east. They would come from the south. And they would all come to hear Jesus' teaching, to see and experience his healing, and to feel and to know that there is a God that loves them. And these people would come. And it says in verse 30 that great crowds came to him, right? Great crowds. Think of it. Throngs of people are coming to Jesus. He's on the mountaintop, and they're coming up one by one. And who were they bringing? They were bringing people from all walks of life and all over. The lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute. And then it says, and many others. The lowest, the least, and the last of what would have been considered that, that culture, that society at that time in history. These people who would have had offered, there was no hope for them. There wasn't, there, there wasn't the medical technology to be able to heal many of these, these infirmaries, these diseases that they had. But it would have been shocking then to a first century Jew, and especially the disciples, that Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and this teaching rabbi, would have had anything to do with people like this, let alone allow them to come into his presence and for him to lay his hands on them because they would have been considered unclean, crippled, mute, lame, blind. But our king of love, Jesus Christ, one by one, received them as they brought them to his feet. And he laid hands on the lame, and he laid hands on the crippled. And he laid hands on the blind. And he laid hands on the mute. Jesus offered the hope and the healing for these people. And that's one of the reasons why today, Christian missionaries for centuries have been going to faraway lands. And they've sent medical teams, doctors, nurses, those in the medical profession and those who can help bring healing to people, physical, to help them with their medical needs. One of the reasons why 
is we take from the Jesus example right here to offer healing and hope. Lesson number two is that caring for the world opens eyes and hearts to the truth of Jesus. Caring for the world opens eyes and hearts to the truth of Jesus. Look with me at verse 31. It says, the people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. And I love that verse. When you unpack it, you think about it. The people were amazed and they praised. And why did they praise? Because they saw what Jesus did. And they praised not their pagan gods, which many of them would have worshipped because they came from faraway lands and distant places, and not the, the single God. They praised, what does it say, church? The God of Israel, the one true God. You see, they saw with their eyes what Jesus was doing and what Jesus did, and they experienced this opening of their eyes to the true God, the God of Israel. And they declared that with their mouths, amen? And see, that's the reason why so many Christian missionaries are willing to go to places that have never heard the name of Jesus Christ, the two billion people around the world that don't even know that Jesus, what he offers to them, and Christian missionaries are willing to go to help people's eyes become opened, not to them, but to because the power of Jesus Christ, the, the true nature, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we go, because it opens eyes and hearts to the truth of Jesus. And lesson number three from our text is, caring for the world meets a need and models the love of Jesus. So it meets a need, and it models the love of Jesus. And see, Jesus didn't offer just to heal here. You notice that? The story continued. In verse 32, we read that Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. I want to just, just think about this a minute. This is Jesus Christ the king of kings, the creator of the universe, the sustainer of the universe, and he feels compassion for these people. And that word compassion in Greek, it literally means to be moved so deeply to the bowels, the deepest, the deepest level of our body. And that the Greek, and in this time, they believed that the bowels, the deepest insides, our innards, was where those emotions like love and pity and empathy that's where they resided. And also in Latin, that word compassion means to suffer together. That's the level of love that Jesus had for these people. That's the level of love that our Savior has for us. And now the question is, is now by this time, Jesus is moved to, with compassion, but how many needs had Jesus already met? How many needs? I mean, it says, you know, scores of people had been coming, and Jesus he could have said, you know what? My time is done here. I've done my healing. Uh, you all go home now. And Jesus could have also said, you know, you really should have thought about this. You really should have planned better and packed your meals, and so you had some food, right? Or Jesus could have said something like, well, the need is way too great. There's way too many people out here. We can't make a difference here. Church, what's the end? What did Jesus say, though? He chose. He chose to make a difference. He chose to care for them in tangible ways. And how did he do it? Jesus met the need. And what was the immediate need? Nutrition, food. And so Jesus did. He, he somehow, it's a mystery, but he miraculously multiplied the food they had, and the people ate and were satisfied. This beautiful picture of Jesus meeting the need practically, and also a great reminder that he alone can satisfy our deepest needs, physically and spiritually. Jesus, the king of love. And that's why when we go in Jesus' name, when we go on missions, and why so many Christians will go, and over the last centuries they've gone, that one of the most basic needs in the world is food and water. 
those basic needs. And Christians are still going today to meet those needs around the world. And our final lesson is caring for the world allows us to be the hands and feet of Jesus. For us to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Now how Jesus fed that many people, as I said, it's a mystery. One day we can ask him when we get to heaven, amen? But until then, what we do know though is how he chose to feed, that's not a mystery. Because in verse 36, it says, Then he took the seven loaves and the fish, and when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. See, it said Jesus, he gave the food to the disciples, and they in turn did what? They gave it to the people. You see, Jesus enlisted the disciples in this process to feed the people. And so just as Jesus did with the disciples, he calls us to do the same today. That we are the ones called to go be his hands and feet, to distribute the food, to go and help find clean water, to go and heal the sick. Jesus calls us. And so when we reflect on these these lessons from this beautiful text in Scripture, we think about that and we apply these lessons and we think about a story um, of a person in modern history that has embodied these lessons and really lived this out, this idea of caring for the world. I think of a man named Everett Swanson. Now, Everett Swanson, many of you may not have never even heard of him, but Everett Swanson was a pastor that uh, lived in Chicago, and in 1952, he was called and asked to go overseas, specifically to go to, the, go to Korea, to go over there and minister and share the gospel. And as you know from history, 1952, we're in the middle of the Korean War, and so Everett Swanson goes over there, and he ministers to the soldiers over there. And he shares the gospel, and many come to be you know, saved and come to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And so one night, while Everett Swanson's there, he's in a small Korean village, and he decides to go out for a walk, and it's a cold Korean night. And those of you who've either from Korea or you've lived in Korea, you know that winters in Korea are very cold. And so Everett Swanson goes over, and he's, he's out for a walk. And as he goes out for a walk, all of a sudden, this little boy comes up, and he takes his jacket, he's carrying his jacket, and he scoops up his jacket, and he runs away with his jacket. Now, again, Everett Swanson's from Chicago, so he does what a good Chicago guy does. He's like, I'm used to this stuff, so I'm going to chase down this little boy. So he goes chasing down the little boy, and he can't find the little boy, and he finds himself in this, like, shanty town. All these, like, tin shacks, and it's just, everything's just dilapidated, just war-torn. And he looks over, and there on the ground, there's his jacket. And so he goes over to pick up his coat, and as he picks up the coat, the coat begins to move, and he lifts up, and underneath the coat... There's three starving, emaciated, skinny little children that have been orphaned because of the war. And so Everett Swanson sees this. And so what does he do? He goes back to the restaurant where he ate earlier, and he gets some food, and he grabs some blankets, and he comes back to that little shanty town, and he begins to help. And as those three children and other children come out of these shacks, And at that time, he just tries to do what he can for them. Well, Everett Swanson goes back to his hotel that night. He gets back to the hotel, and the words that kept coming to him over and over and over again are, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? So Everett Swanson gets on a plane, and he heads back home, and the whole time on the plane, those words, what are you going to do about it? And he can't get this, this, this picture out of his mind because what he realized The night when he got there, the next morning he comes back. And he came back, he was so moved that he's looked and and he looks on the street and there's there's a garbage truck that's moving through the neighborhood. And as the garbage truck moves through the neighborhood, there's soldiers. And soldiers are scooping up these little rags and they're throwing them in the back of the garbage truck. And as he gets closer to the garbage truck, to his horror, he realizes that these are the bodies of children that didn't make it through the night. These children, orphaned by war, had no hope. And so as he gets on that plane and heads back home, he tells this story to a couple of his friends. And his friends say, we've got $1,000. You've got to go back to Korea, and you've got to establish something. You've got to do something about this, Everett. Now, at that time, of course, the Korean government was in the middle of the war. The U.S. was fighting the war. So there was nobody that was going to help these children. And Everett Swanson went back. 
And one year after that, he established his first orphanage. One orphanage, 1953. That orphanage grew to five orphanages over the years, then to 10 orphanages, and eventually over 100 orphanages in Korea were established under the leadership of Everett Swanson. And for many of you today, that organization continues to thrive. Long after Everett Swanson passed away, Everett Swanson established this organization because he acted in obedience to God's call to make a difference in the lives of these children and that organization today, many of you are familiar with this international organization because today it's known as Compassion International. And Compassion International today, more than 1.9 million children are being rescued from poverty in Jesus' name. In 26 different countries, Everett Swanson established that organization. And today, Compassion International provides clean water and food and education and, and provides children with all the basic needs they need, and most importantly, it provides them with the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. One man's act of obedience changed the world. Changed the world. And so we think about that for us, and we consider Everett Swanson's story and the lessons from the gospel. The question for us then is, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about this world that we live in today with those stark numbers, those sobering numbers? What are we going to do about it? And so how can we care practically for this world? What are some simple steps that I could take? So I want to give you just a framework, kind of a, a, a five ideas for you to consider that as the Lord moves, if the Lord were to move you, that you could consider one of these or two or three or all of these. And the first of those is praying. Church, every great movement of God has started with the prayer of his people. And so if we look and say, how can I care for the world? And we don't begin to pray for the world, pray for the children of the world. Pray for organizations that are going in Jesus' name. Pray for ways that I can be a minister to go into the world. Then we're missing something. We come to God and we pray. So my wife and I, um, a couple, a couple, about a week ago, we were watching the news. And we were watching what's going on, you know, obviously down on the, the Mexican-U.S. Uh, border. And when we saw these images of children that were being abandoned or being dropped over and, and just our hearts were moved. And I was so upset. And my wife said, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> She said, what are we going to do about it? One of the many reasons why I love her is she moved, I was moved. And so we began to pray. Both her and I have been praying. I'm praying. I'm asking how I individually can do something about this crisis. How can I help those children? But also, how can we as a church, what can we do? Asking God's wisdom and discernment as we navigate that and consider how we can help. So praying. The next one is partnering partnering. How can we come alongside organizations and people who are ministering in Jesus' name? One of the great organizations recently that my wife and I, we came to know is called Open Doors. Open Doors is a Christian missionary society. They are a group that actually equips and encourages people that are being persecuted in countries around the world. And this organization, Open Doors, they consider you when, you, when you say sign up and you get in, they say you are a frontline partner. They don't consider you as a donor. They don't consider you as a sponsor. They say you're our partner. And so I, I feel like that's one of the areas where I can really grow and is partnering with organizations like Open Doors and so many others. And it's very simple in that they, Open Doors, they'll send me an email every day. Say, here's the situation. They'll give you a story of someone in, in, in the world, and then they'll give you prayer prompts, like how you can be praying for this family, how you can pray for this pastor and his family. It's a beautiful organization, but that's partnering in one of many ways that we can care for the world. How about sharing? Sharing. It's a way for us to help inform the rest of the world, the rest of the country, the rest of our friends of the needs around the world. And so we think about this thing, social media today. 
We have an advantage over those in previous generations and that we have the power of technology on our side when it comes to this idea of sharing, that we can actually help inform people of the needs around the world by leveraging things like our own social media. We can help write letters. We can send emails. We can go to websites of these different organizations to become better informed of the specific needs. And then we can share that with other people. One of the ways that you can care for the world, very simple. And also going. Now, I realize that for every one of us in this room, we're at different life stages, different life circumstances. But for some of you, you have special skills, you have unique experience, you have education, you have gifts, and you have passion that you want to go make a difference. You want to physically go somewhere and make a difference on the ground. And you want to leverage those gifts and skills and abilities you have. There's a man named David Eubanks. When I was getting ready to retire from the Army several years ago, my commanding general called me in and he said, Hey, Sean, I know you're getting out of the military and you're going into ministry. I was answering a call, my God, to go into the ministry here at Shoreline Church. So he said, There's a guy I want to connect you with. His name is David Eubanks. See, David Eubanks was a rising U.S. Army Ranger commander, special forces officer. He was doing great things for our country, serving. He also was the son of a missionary family. And so David, at some point in his career, he felt this call from God, this clear call that the military was no longer where God wanted him to serve, but God was calling him into serving somewhere in the world. And so David and his wife Karen, 15 years ago, established a Christian missionary organization called the Free Burma Rangers. And so David, with his unique skills, his military background, he and his family had gone to places like Burma, which is Myanmar, also Iraq, Kurdistan, northern Iraq. He also sent people, they're going all over the world, different places where the name of Jesus has never been heard nor proclaimed. And David and his family, yes, his wife and their three young adult kids have been doing this over the last 15 years. And we don't have the ability to show it, but if you would like to learn more about free Burma Rangers and see how this man, uniquely gifted and called by God to minister, to care for the world that way, you can see his documentary on, it's called Free Burma Rangers. And it's a beautiful story of one man being obedient to God's call and acting in obedience to God and making a difference in places like Burma, Iraq, and Syria. And then the final area is giving. You think about this idea that God has blessed us so richly. We can take a portion of those resources and we can care for the world in a tangible way. And so one specific area, one very simple practical way is that that organization that Everett Swanson established, Compassion International, they still have needs today. They still sponsor children around the world. And so today, for $38 a month, this is that much, at $38 a month, you can sponsor a child somewhere in the world that desperately needs food, water, medical, education, and most importantly, the hope of Jesus Christ. And so Compassion International, my wife and I, we, we didn't know anything about Compassion International. Maybe that's you today. I've never heard of Compassion International. We didn't know anything about it. In 2012, when I was a student at Naval Postgraduate School, we came here in September, and we heard a message, and they, the call to action was, would you consider today to sponsor a Compassion International child? So my wife and I, moved by the Holy Spirit, we went out into the courtyard, and we saw the needs of hundreds of children around the world. And at that time, Shoreline was working hard to get sponsors for children in El Salvador. And so we found a packet of a little boy named Joel, three years old, a skinny little boy. And we said, Lord, is this the boy you'd like us to sponsor? And his answer was clear. Nine years later, after We've sponsored every month. We were able to, to, to bless him with $38. Folks, think about it, $38. If I just cut one Starbucks out of my weekly intake, that's $38. $38. My wife and I today, we've written letters. We've sent birthday cards. We've been able to bless him at Christmas. 
and he sends us letters, and we get updates. And here's a picture. I want to show you a picture today. There's a copy of the last letter he sent us and his picture. Nine years later, and my wife and I look at that, and we go, oh, Lord, what great joy we have knowing that we had the opportunity to be part of his life, to care for one little boy, to make a difference in Jesus' name. And so today we're going to offer you that opportunity. When you go out into the courtyard today, we have a team out there, and they've got packets of children from around the world, and you can sponsor one of those children. Now, we don't want you to do it out of obligation or feeling you know, compul- compulsion. We want you to pray and ask God. Ask God if he would like you to sponsor a child. For $38 a month, you are investing in eternal difference in their life. So we want to invite you to do that. And also, I, just so you know, when we reached out to Compassion International, we said, we would like to have some packets of children from around the world. Would you send us packets where there's the greatest need? And they did. They sent us 30 packets from around the world. And when we got the packets, I called them back up. And I said, hey, you only sent us 30 packets. And they said, well, that's about what the average church, about on a Sunday. See, most of those packets will be gone, but that's the average church. I said, listen, Shoreline is not your average church. Amen? We're not the average church. And so I said, you need to send more. So yesterday, we got more packets in. So there are plenty of children out there. And one of the, my prayers today has been that when we leave today, there won't be any of those packets out there that they'll be in your hands, the hands of Shoreline Church, the people that want to care for the world in tangible ways. Caring for the world. And so as I wrap up and as we get ready to send you out, I want to leave you with Jesus, some of Jesus' final words to his disciples. Before he ascended to heaven, we read in Acts 1.8, Jesus said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so as Jesus called his disciples to care for the church, to care for their neighbors, and to care for the world. We're called to do the same today. And we don't do it by ourselves. We go in his presence, in his power, the power of the Holy Spirit. And so may Jesus' final words to his disciples be the words that fill our hearts and our minds and move our hands and feet all the days of our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, We thank you that you are good. Jesus, we thank you that you saved us. You loved us enough to offer your life for us. And when we place our faith in you, Jesus, our eternity is changed forever. And Jesus, in that reality, I pray, Lord, that we would also feel the same sense of love and care and compassion that you did for a world that is desperately broken, that is hopeless by human eyes. And Jesus, you call us into that world. So Jesus, as you did with your disciples, I pray that you would move us out from here to be your hands and feet, to make a difference for this world. In your name, Jesus. And we pray that in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I've got a couple of just final words as we get ready to send you out of here. Um, First of all, if you, as you leave, um, just go ahead and check out the courtyard. You can see out in the courtyard, we've got some uh, tables out there with opportunities for you to connect. If you'd like to learn more about Compassion International, you want to talk more about what what is Shoreline doing right now in the area of global missions, Pastor Ben and his team are out there. They would love to talk with you. And for those of you who are watching online, if you'd like to learn more, just go ahead and send an email. You can send that to info at Shoreline, or you can send it to Ben at shoreline.church. Pastor Ben would love to talk with you as well. And for those of you here on campus uh, for prayer, we would love to pray with you. If you have a prayer need, our prayer teams will be over here and over here. Love to pray with you. This great high of joy that you've got in your life, or maybe something you're walking through, we'd love to pray with you about that. And of course, for those of you who are online, you can call that number on the screen, and you can go ahead and the team there will pray with you. And then if you're new today, 
Hey, we're so thankful that you came and chose to come to worship at Shoreline Church today. A special welcome to our new families at you're here today, and we want to encourage you as you leave and go out of the worship center, if you would go out into the Connection Center there, and Patty's there, and she'd love to talk with you, get to know you a little bit, and give you a free gift. And of course, if you're online today, you're joining us, you go ahead and text the word welcome to the number that's on your screen, and they have a digital connections card they'd love to send you. So if you are able, would you stand and receive the blessing as we send you out from this place today? So as you go from this place... Go in the name and the power and the presence of the one who loves you, the one who saved you, and the one that calls you to be his hands and feet. Go in his power and in his presence, and may God bless you as you do. Have a great day. God bless.